This week here on Mastering Dungeons in our main segment, we're going to do two things. We're going to do a 2024 5e mini review, and then we're going to cover some more regions from the Living Greyhawk Gazetteer. And Teos, Teos is double fist in the books there. He uh, has a oh, he's he's even going to throw in a bonus book. But first, let's talk about 2024. And this week, we are going to look at weapon mastery. First Love question, it. Teos. Yes, sir. What what would you say the design goal is for weapon mastery and weapon mastery properties? Uh, to make money by having one exciting new thing. Wait, 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 you said design goal. Sorry, that was my mistake. Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I guess what you'd say, right? And I, I held up the uh, complete Gladiator's Handbook from the Dark Sun uh, complete series of second edition because... It has something very similar to this, as, as others have noted. It has a section about weapons, and in it, it comes up with these ideas of when you are proficient or when you have a specialization, then you can do extra things with all your weapons, right? So you can have like an Alholak, and when you're proficient, you can uh, you don't have to worry about the downside of the weapon, which it has normally. And mm -hmm. then you can use it two handed. And then when you're specialized, you can now like grapple this other person and ensnare them with extra bonuses and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, in second edition, various of these books had these kinds of things. And the point of it was to tr tr create some tactical play, mm -hmm. some engagement uh, and to reward kind of your choice, especially as a fighter class, to mm -hmm. kind of focus on these particular weapons and show your mastery of them and sort of you know you're not just using a longsword you know how to do all these cool things with your longsword right and with your spear and whatever so it's a creation of engagement in play for those characters that use weapons and if you take a step back some of the argument was because spellcasters have lots of tactical great choice weapon people just stab and you round after round so this gives you kind of like the parody with the spell casting class though i could say and i'll shut up past third edition your melee classes also have a variety of tricks through subclasses and whatever so i don't know that you super aren't on parody already but you know maybe that's part of the design goal still what do you think yeah i i agree i think it adds a tactical element to the game that maybe 2020 2014 was missing or maybe it wasn't but we've certainly seen games come out since then or versions mm -hmm. of 5e that have come out since then that lean very very strongly into this tactical realm and so i think I, despite your facetious claim that right we want to give something new in this book uh -huh. that's coming out mm -hmm. uh it's the going DMG to add will get bastions it. we're covered yeah. yay Woo. <laughs> uh, it, it adds a tactical element to the game yeah. whether or not the tactical element was needed that's a whole other question mm. um, well, that will and, bear yeah, out through play maybe we could say design goals don't muck up the works uh-huh uh-huh well, we'll see, because in 2014, there was no weapon mastery properties. Mm -hmm. uh, certain subclasses, as you say, Teos, certain classes, certain other elements of the game could bring this tactical play to bear, right? The battle master fighter right. could do certain things by spending dice and and uh, mm -hmm. using uh, different abilities, yeah. uh, but that wasn't something that could carry through to the rogue or the mm -hmm. monk or right. those other characters. Though the rogue and the monk had other choices to they, make yes. and, you know, the paladin right. with their smiting. And, you know, so it's not, again, yep. it's not like you didn't have anything, but, but yes, yeah. most rounds you were swinging that weapon, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the 2024 player's handbook has weapon mastery and mastery properties. So each weapon has a mastery property, which is usable if a character has 
the weapon mastery feature. And who has the weapon mastery feature? Most martial classes. Uh, what are these properties then that can be used based on the weapon for those classes that have this feature? We'll go through them real quickly here. Cleave. If you hit a creature with a melee uh, weapon attack using a weapon with the cleave property, you can make a melee attack roll with that weapon against a second creature within five feet of the first that is also within your reach. If you hit, the second creature takes the weapon's damage, but you don't add the ability modifier to that damage unless the modifier is negative, and you can only do this once per turn. Okay. So there are a lot of riders that go in there. Yeah. And let me, like, right. if I can add one more thing, like a class sure. will tell you whether you get them and how many you get, right? So the Barbarian right. gets two at first level. It increases mm -hmm. to third at fourth level. Then it goes to fourth for the rest of your career once you reach 10th level. So mm -hmm. you, you have a number of these that you can have. And sometimes depending on your class, you'll have an option like you can actually wield one weapon, but apply the weapon mastery to another. So it can get kind of tricksy. Um, yeah. But it's that idea of, yeah, you focus in on a certain number of, of, of weapons that then you gain their properties. And the table of weapons tells you what has a property and then you can, you know, go from that. Yep. Which would then behoove you to both outside of the game make plans that you can then use inside of the game to make choices. So it does that double duty of the quote unquote lonely fun of planning and then the at the table fun yep. of executing that plan. Yep. So in that sense, it's very, uh, it's very reasonable and attractive to different kinds of players and different kinds of play. Uh, so Cleave, as, as I described, it could be very powerful, so you get in all you begin to get those riders. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can only do it once per turn. Otherwise, every time you attack that your turn, you could be hitting two people. You can't add that uh, ability modifier to the damage. Okay, but still, it is an attack roll and it is a hit. So anything that is triggered by a successful attack roll and a hit could do that. Unless it is somehow the thing that you're trying to do is limited. Right. So smiting comes into question. Sneak attack comes into question. So you can see that you have to do all of these things. Okay. But if the if the weapon does an extra 1d6 fire damage on a successful hit, then you do get to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we begin to get into the need to look at all of these edge cases. Yeah to make sure that it's not um, broken, broken. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the I, idea, I'm sure it will be at some point. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea is that tactical piece, right? So for Cleave alone, we can think of like, OK, now I as the player want to try to find clumps of creatures, right? I want to go up uh, or draw to me, you know, several creatures so that when I attack one, I might be able to hit the other, right? So a boss fight or the last creature or that one lone archer, I don't really want to go after that. I want to go over the like the several people together, which is maybe dangerous and might be fun in that way. Um, but that becomes the kind of MO I want to do. And what often happens with these design wise is people will say to themselves, well, can I do that reliably? Because if not, I'm not getting my benefit that I am due. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll choose a different property and they'll keep reading. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm waiting to use my Vorpal Sword and my crit on an 18 to 20 to uh, to decapitate two creatures in a row yeah. with the same attack. Yeah, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, and I haven't looked at Vorpal Sword in the 2024 rules. So we'll see if how, yeah. how all of yep. that works out. Uh, so this cleave, graze. If your attack roll with the weapon misses, you still deal damage equal to your ability modifier that you use to make the attack roll. Uh, damage is the same type as dealt by the weapon, and damage can be increased only by increasing the ability modifier. So you miss, but you still do five points of damage if you're at a 20 strength with your strength-based attack. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. Nick. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just, you know, it's interesting also to look at the design cost of these. You know, we talked about that, you know, do you muck things up, right? So with Cleave, well, you've got to make an extra attack roll every round, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, but it's pretty easy to look up, but you've got to do that second attack. And then there's this question of all these interactions that is, you know, a little worrisome. Gray's pretty simple in that if you missed, you just, once you get through it, you will remember, oh yeah, you know, three damage, right? You just, you shout it out. I missed, takes three damage from, from Gray's, move on. Not too bad. Mm -hmm. Nick, when you make the extra attack of the light property, you can make it as part of the attack action instead of as a bonus action. You can make this extra attack only once per turn. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, I have the short sword in one hand, I have the dagger in the other. Because I'm using this extra attack, has a light property normally would be a bonus action to make it now i can make it as part of the regular attack action okay cool what you're really doing here is saving a bonus action right and that bonus action might be useless for some character mm -hmm. builds and might be the complete difference between a normal character and a broken character right. for other classes mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, monks tend to use their bonus actions. A lot of classes do. And so if you need that bonus action to do things, then this Nick quality on a weapon makes sense because now you get one extra attack on top of everything else you would have done. And you still get your bonus action for additional attacks or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so, it, it, you know, again, we're looking at sort of making another attack roll with, I think, a little more decision making here. So it's even slower maybe than than uh, mm -hmm. Cleave was. Uh, because it's it's a little more at case by case basis thinking. Um, mm -hmm. The the other thing is there is plenty of confusion as our Discord was pointing out between the light property Nick and the dual weapon weapon fighting feat. You have to read to what am I really getting or not getting if I have various of these. So yeah, there's that. It it is it is interesting, mm -hmm. uh, and. As soon as you give people another attack roll, you are opening up a lot. It's one mm -hmm. thing to say, okay, you just do an extra three damage, whether it's from Graze or just you could make Nick, uh, you do an extra blank damage. Right. Uh, but you have to differentiate it. Otherwise, yep. people say, oh, it's just the same thing. So uh, yep. it it becomes interesting. And yeah, I've seen a lot of talk about this one. Uh, next is push. If you hit a creature with this weapon, you can push the creature up to 10 feet straight away from you uh, if it is large or smaller. It's interesting they didn't go with your size or smaller, but yeah, fine, whatever. Right. Um, yeah. yeah, this is generally the kind of thing that people will, will not choose because it's mm -hmm. so seldom useful. It's useful if there's a pit right behind them or something like that, but usually you can't kind of punish them by going through a spell that they already took damage from, but it depends on the kind of application, um, yeah. you know, on the wording of things. But it, it, it's, it's a, this is the kind of thing people where you go, I don't know that this is going to help me much. You, you could arguably, what would be fun is I think of like two NPCs that actually one of them has push and the other one has cleaves. <laughs> you can always push mm -hmm. people together for the cleave to work. But players generally don't do that kind of thing. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of these, there's only a couple of weapons that have it. Mm. Uh, like with push, it's only pikes, war hammers, mm. or heavy crossbows, unless oh, yeah. I'm missing something. Oh, heavy crossbow, uh, wow. And, and a great club, sorry, and a great club. Okay. Uh, but yeah, in it's so very situational. In the game that I run where... The whole shtick is create different spell cactus, create different damaging areas, and then they are enemies are dragged through uh, through grapple or through spells that move. <laughs> that this would be huge. This oh, would be yeah. Yeah. mammoth. And in in a theater of the mind game, uh, probably not at all, unless there was some sort of feat that went into it like uh polar master where it was if they approach you you can take a you know use your reaction to take an attack uh so it uh it's again as it is it's when you start adding and layering in feats yeah. and other 
uh, abilities and other features where it can become something else. Yeah. Uh, sap. If you had a creature with this weapon, the creature has disadvantage on its next attack roll before the start of your next turn. I uh, hate it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't like it either. And I find it strange that like a long sword has the sap feature, what? right? Because you think of a sap, you think of boop, boop, boop. Yeah. And, and so it's like, well, we need to do something with the long sword. Okay, Mace, let's, uh, let's do that. Yeah. A long sword. Yeah, long sword. That's strange. Yep. I guess maybe uh, they're thinking of like you're hitting with the pommel or something like that, or they just ran out of options for the long sword. I yeah, don't know. yeah. Yeah. The problem I have here is that I, my opinion is disadvantage. You shouldn't be giving disadvantage to things unless mm -hmm. it's with something you've come up with a fun situation. Like I'm going to topple crates onto this creature. I'm down with that, right? You spent your action for that and it's a neat effect. I love the story of it. Uh, maybe if it's a spell that does it, but you've got to be careful of that, you know, you don't want it spammed all the time. The spamming is the biggest thing I'm worried about because if I'm going to sap the boss constantly and always give disadvantage to the monster, it's going to have such an unequal effect, but especially on a monster that takes like one big attack. Mm -hmm. Then it's next attack roll. It's a huge thing to have disadvantage on it. And AC is already often through the roof on the person who's tanking this thing. So I just worry that this is not, it's the, it's the opposite of what the DM wants, right? <laughs> right. And, and it begs then the DM to come up with ways to mitigate it, which yeah. makes the player feel bad. Yeah. Well, it makes the player feel like the DM is against them, but the DM is just trying to tell, for the most part, with most game masters, not how we're mad people, but mm -hmm. right, I, I want the dragon with its one big bite attack to to do the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so what do I do? Well, okay, I'm going to make sure I use a, one of the layer, not layer actions, but legendary, legendary actions, actions to to do a small thing to get rid of that penalty so that when i do the big thing it and and so it if you're playing a just completely tactical game great have at it you can have fun countering everyone's thing and and you know being witty and and playing that chess match but if it's story driven and you really want to build up the story and the excitement it 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 isn't fun it isn't exciting yeah. it doesn't lead to good narrative it, it's tough and 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 a lot of it depends on how your characters are using it if they will just use it every now and then it can be very different right but the same thing with this next one slow right you hit the creature with this weapon and deal damage to it you can reduce its speed by 10 feet on the start of next turn and it does say if it's hit if the creature is hit more than once by weapons that have this property the speed reduction can't exceed 10 feet, which is good, but you could maybe ray of frosted or something else. And, and you know, and again, that's where it gets non fun. It's one thing if it takes a little longer for the monster to get to you. If the monster is never going to get to the party, that would be a problem, right? If, if this was a tactic that everybody employs, I'll hit it with ray of frost. You hit it with this thing. It'll never reach us. We will murder it before it ever comes to us. Yeah. Fun once. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, topple. If you hit a creature with this weapon, you can force the creature to make a constitution saving throw. And I failed save. The creature has the prone condition. Yeah. Um, this is the only one that has a saving throw. Mm -hmm. And I was, part of me is glad that you don't have to roll a saving throw every time because especially when fighters or other martial classes get two or three attacks in a round or four to have to roll that every time slows the game down. Yeah. But it's powerful enough in this case that they have to give it a saving throw. Otherwise it goes, this creature goes prone and then everyone wails on it. Unless you're casting, a, you know, unless you're using ranged weapons Rings, yeah. with advantage. Um, which can be very mm -hmm. powerful. Or 
the biggest trick I've seen is it's got the prone condition. Now I reduce its speed to zero somehow. <laughs> and and you can do so me. with right a simple grapple. Uh, then it can't stand. So now all its attacks, if it's a martial cast, if it's a martial creature, are made with disadvantage and all attacks against it are at advantage, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns into a problem. Yeah, yeah. I heard somebody, I can't remember if it was on our Discord or in my home game, but uh, someone was talking about a group that played and within a few minutes they decided to all take topple and every creature was prone in every combat forever. <laughs> the DM mm -hmm. was just like, this is the worst. <laughs> and, and, and I don't mean to be negative, right? I mean, it's not like you can't have fun with this. And again, the more that your players are doing this as sort of just fun things every now and then, it's great. But that's the thing about Weapon Master is that it kind of encourages you to just do this all the time and always be proning everything. And then begs that question of, well, how could I abuse this, right? How could I take this to another level? And that's where you can end up with the, yeah, and its strength is drained and it has to consume half its movement standing up. So then I can, uh, you know, this, that, and the other. And too many cases can show up where someone's going to write a, yeah. ga a guide on it, right? And mm -hmm. yeah. So, so here's, here's my solution. Uh, you know, I third edition and fourth edition, I loved playing and DMing tactical battles. Mm -hmm. I loved that chess match and I loved trying to give players tease them to take the most optimal thing, but they had to give up something or they had to think their way around a situation. Loved it. Fifth edition, I was very happy to get away from that tactical play, go to more narrative play. Um, so here we go. We're getting back into the tactical stuff. My solution for this might be for my home game to limit the number of times they can do a thing. Right. Almost put it on encounter refresh like Corey. It's, it's exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. This is an encounter power. Yeah. And or maybe even twice per encounter. Mm -hmm. You can do you can use your weapon mastery mm -hmm. uh, because then it gives them the option to do it at the exact right time right. without doing this spamming. The of, loop. Yeah. 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 What are your thoughts overall on weapon mastery and what we've seen here? Well, we also didn't talk about Vex. Let's just quickly say Vex. Oh, if you hit a creature with sorry. this weapon and deal damage to the creature, you have advantage on your next attack roll against the creature before the end of your next turn. All right. Overall thoughts. None of these have drawbacks, which is interesting design wise. I don't object with that. Right. But but it would be, let's say, balanced with 2014 if we said I can Vex the creature, but I deal no damage this turn. Right. So I'm going to have mm -hmm. advantage next round, but I dealt no damage or I, or I didn't add my ability score or something, you know, some drawback to it that would make me choose. Right. I can topple the creature, but, you know, I give dis I have uh, give advantage to everybody because I put so much focus into toppling them. Mm -hmm. But there's none of that. This is just gravy. Take mm -hmm. everything your character was doing before. You now get this bonus stuff and potentially quite, quite bonusy if you put it all together. That means the monsters, which are already considered easy, have to do even more work for the challenge to be at the same level. Mm -hmm. Because in theory, what we want design-wise is fun tactics, fun choices, engagement, mm -hmm. but not that the players always auto-win. So now some right. other part of the game will have to do that work for you to compensate. Yep. So it's still the same challenge level, and yep. you're still having that engagement and that fun. And the engagement and fun of these weapon masteries have to balance out with the extra time you're taking to run your character and the, the resolving of all of it, both you doing it and it being resolved, right? Oh, that's right. My monster is prone, says the DM. My bad. Let me remember to. OK, so no, he didn't get to there. Uh, they were back here. And they so they can't reach you, so they wouldn't have attacked you. They'll attack this other person instead. Or, oh, no, you know what? They'll take the range weapon out. It's so easy for all that to bog down. And one of the dangers with games is that we say, it will be so much fun when we do all these things. And yes, it is fun. Like, it is. But at the end of the game, we feel a little dissatisfied. And it's because there's so much rigmarole 
that we didn't do the thing that we really love, which is creativity, mm -hmm. fun back and forth, thinking in the moment, right? A lot of the games that are the best games bring those qualities to, yes, they have meaty, fun play and all that, but also the time to, to, to dream and characters, right? Like when we played MCDM's game, I had a, mm -hmm. I had a great time playing Draw Steel. Mm -hmm. But I came up with a shtick for my character, who was a warlord tactician type, that he would call his mom for help on some magical telephone because he had no idea. He's very new. And so, you know, the first couple of times I role played and someone in the, you noted on the YouTube video, and it was a funny concept of like, uh, mom, there's like a guy in the other room. What should I do? You know, like, oh, go, you know, use this power. OK, but there wasn't kind of time to do that. Right. Partly it's being online, but partly it's because the game is so meaty that mm -hmm. trying to work in the role playing takes, you know, a little bit of extra mm -hmm. energy around all the tactics, at least until you learn all this stuff. And mm -hmm. but I love that stuff. That's the stuff I want in my games. Right. And so they can fight each other. Right. So that's a long way of saying that um, I'm interested to experiment with these uh, because I do like tactical play. I am worried that this is a load that will detract from my fun in a game. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the reasons I think that we saw the 2014 5e rules and the player's handbook sales do the ever upward mm -hmm. sales growth rather than falling mm -hmm. off. Yeah is because the play that the rules brought to players, especially new players, was quick and fun and mm -hmm. fast and witty. Yeah, I agree. And, and not for every group, sure. but in general. Yep. In general, yep. And I feel like we're moving in a direction where the rules are not going to draw in new players the way that the 2014 rules maybe yeah. they wouldn't have anyway but i i fear that direction and these oh, weapon yeah. mastery feats are great for a subset i fear they're not great for the greater play audience i absolutely agree with you it, it's hard because there's it, you can't get data to back it up you know and so it's tough sure. Uh, but I absolutely feel like you do. I have that feeling that one of the keys to 2014's success was that the rules are so elegant and they are mm -hmm. basic. So you can play any type of game, whatever your impression is of fantasy. Even if it's heroic superhero type fantasy, it could work with what 2014 gave you. As mm -hmm. 2014 has gotten tasha and on and on and now 2024, it is more and more super heroic whether mm -hmm. you want it to or not and it doesn't you know I, I was thinking actually in the shower today i would have loved if master profic properties mastery properties were an option yep but they're baked in and right. and there's no right so if you want to play 2024 but you find that these are not creating the effect you want or if a player game goes God, this is so complicated i just want to play a fighter what happened i was supposed you told me it was the simple class but i'm you know i used nick and everybody got mad at me and or you know i used a sap and 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 then the dm seemed to not feel good you know what, what am i doing wrong you know it's just it's it's that load that load is is significant and and so hard to quantify right it's so hard to see why a game is great or not but i've played a lot of third edition and fourth edition where players said this is too much for me and they didn't want to play anymore and 2014 largely avoided that. Not always, mm -hmm. but largely. And now it feels like we're yeah, definitely headed in that direction. I agree with you. Yep. Well, we will get rid of Weapon Mastery and we will bring up this wonderful world of Greyhawk. We have been going through the Greyhawk Gazetteer and talking about the Living Greyhawk campaign. And we are in the midst of going through Greyhawk region by region and talking about these regions as both a part of the world and as a trigger for bringing fun adventures and fun encounters into your game. 
But we had a question first, and I wanted to make sure we address that. So this comes from Gareth via YouTube. Uh, Gareth asks, when you say you were a triad member of a region, what exactly did you mean? I may have missed the explanation, so a link to where you talk about it would be great. I don't remember the exact place that we talked about it, but it was several times along the way mm -hmm. when we started talking about Greyhawk, where we talked about this. But we'll sum it up very quickly here. And, and I think particularly our second show on Greyhawk was when we talked about living Greyhawk itself. The first one was the yep. history of Greyhawk. So I think it was our second show where we really kind of went into this. There you go. So during Living Greyhawk, the, the world was divided up into regions, and those regions were overseen by a group of three volunteers. Generally, each volunteer had a different role. One was the writing director who, mm -hmm. would, who was responsible for creating the adventures that went out to players of that regional uh, adventure campaign. The second person was generally the community manager type person. They would talk with the people in the region or people coming to the region, answer questions, do fun things like in-character contests and, and things like that. The third person was generally in charge of regional meta organizations or regional um rules and mm -hmm. those meta organizations were generally groups that sprung up to fulfill a specific role within the story of the campaign so you might have guilds you might have fighting companies you might yeah. have uh knighthoods and those sorts of things uh secret spies so those, you could join yeah. some, some of the groups would be like secret you had to be invited to them or have an opportunity in adventure that would let you join the special you know whatever Precisely. it was <laughs> Yeah. Arcane so Duel. when everything was working well, those three triad members were working in lockstep to create an amazing experience for the players in that region or the players of the adventures from outside the region. Mm -hmm. uh, what it generally turned into was one person running everything and then other people try to, trying to help, yeah. whether the person refused the help or was not good at marshalling resources um triad members became very susceptible to the burned out condition mm -hmm. <laughs> and or the at one condition, point or at one point i was the only triad member in a region so i was doing all of the above and trying to bring people in to help and sometimes it like any organization yeah. it had it had its problems and common, that's why the yeah. common problem back in third edition was the world of warcraft hit one of the triad members and they disappeared just playing world of warcraft and we we laugh about how fourth edition was designed but it was true that we were seeing this happen yeah yep so uh that's what a triad member was it was a volunteer who was in charge of a region mm -hmm. in a very in some capacity or another so thank you for that question. I hope that answers it. And, and just I want to say one last thing, which is the idea was really cool, right? Because if you take like, say, Adventures League, there is an admin set that run everything. But nobody's trying to push individual storylines in that kind of level of detail. And so breaking the world into these regional groupings with regional admins created a lot more capacity for like incredible play because mm -hmm. all of these storylines had their own administrative team. And even if it was one person largely doing the work, you could have incredible stories coming out of some regions. Now, when it fell apart, it fell apart hard. But when it That's worked, true. it could do what you never could have just with a regular campaign, right? So Living Forgotten Realms had regions and it had some admins, but it works slightly differently. Couldn't quite do the same thing that Living Greyhawk had done. And certainly with yep. Adventures League, you have a great team of admins but you can't get that flavor that you would have if you had these regional groups and so on. Very, very true. Speaking of these regional groups, we are going to dive right in and continue our look at Chapter 4, the Gazetteer of the Flanais. Uh We ended with Keoland, over which I was a triad member, and now we get into Cat, which I believe was represented by, was it Eastern Canada? 
uh in, yeah, in Ontario and Nova Scotia yeah. and yeah, New Brunswick, yeah, a couple other areas, yep. Yeah. Part of Canada. So so what is Cat's deal? Cat is a feudal monarchy with a semi-hereditary rulership uh matrix. The leader of or the ruler of Cat is called the Bagref. Bagrefs have this monarchical power, but they do answer to other power groups, including religious leaders and merchant clans. Uh, Teos, ge geographically, what are we looking at? Yeah. For so we talked about like high folk. This is west of high folk where we talked about. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. still close to the center of Greyhawk if you're looking at the map, but a little west of it. And what it does is control that sort of flow. If you were coming from sort of the Bakloonish West and Zaif uh, and the old areas there to the West, you would have to go through Ket to kind of go through one of these narrow areas. If you're not going to cross the big, huge mountains, you're coming through Ket. And then you'll either go down to Bissell to the south or you'll go through mountain passes to get towards Valuna or High Folk to the east. And that was a lot of the tension. There's a lot of historic tension, particularly with Bissell, which is where you'd have to go if you wanted to go through Ket and down into like the Sheldamar Valley towards Kiel and anything like that. If you want to get to the ocean quickly, you're going either through Bissell or Valuna. Yeah. So it's a very, very small area. And especially the area that's habitable is very small. It's got the, the Yatil Mountains on one side. It's got the Barrier Peak Mountains on the other. And right in the center of it all is the Bramblewood Forest, which then makes it even less uh, less normal plains, fields, places to grow crops. Uh, yeah. And but its its um, its position makes it very valuable as goods and services pass through from the uh, Backloonish West and the the lands that everyone left during the Twin Cataclysm to get to Eastern, uh, to get to Eastern, the Eastern Flanaeus. Uh, so it, mercantilism is a big part of mm -hmm. Cat, as is religion, yeah. because there is only one faith in Cat, and that is Alec Bar. Mm -hmm. And so, it has a very uh, crusades feel in its history. Yeah, if you think as, of the Moors invading Spain, it has yeah. that feel to it. And if, if you know, you know, kind of like the 600 or so years that the Moors ruled Spain, it has that feel with sort of how it took over Bissell and then retreated. Uh, it feels like that was sort of a parallel they were going for here. Very much so, almost to the point of uncomfortableness uh, in, in some cases. So in its history, it has this uh, has this Backloonish feel to the point where uh, one of its leaders back in history uh, allied with Ayuz in order to repel invaders, but make gains in other areas. And that's when they invaded Bissell yeah. and, and took over parts of Bissell uh, while everyone was distracted by fighting Ayuz. The old killing in the name uh, of peace. Yes, precisely, precisely. So it's got this history. It's got this dual sort of mercantile but religious uh, component to it. Uh, and there is obviously a tension. There's the leader, and the leader is always trying to balance the power of, of the faith versus the power of the merchant clans and gets into trouble if they ever lean one way or the other too far. And this is the kind of campaign that, or the region that feels to me like an NPC. Like it, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing you put over somewhere so that, you know, you might have to deal with it periodically, but then go back to whatever you were doing. It doesn't right. feel like a place that I'd want to live in and launch adventures. And when I look at like the, you mentioned here in your show notes as well, contra conflicts and intrigues doesn't easily lend itself to things adventurers want to do and how to operate within this society seems kind of difficult. There's not a lot of support for it. And I think kept struggled as a region in third edition and during Living Greyhawk because of that it had its conflict with Bissell, 
but it was hard to make that conflict interesting and not just we're the bad guys, right? And one of I I only went to play in cat once and the and only for a very brief short amount of time. But the big thing that you had to the trope that was Bissell was follow the laws, especially the religious laws, or you end up losing time units in the salt mines. Mm -hmm. And so you had to follow the rules and not do this and not do that. And it's fun once or twice, but when it's a constant refrain that you can't, especially if it's something that your character would normally do or want to do, uh, having to do an entire character, especially with this regional thing where you can't just go and play in another region. Right. Uh, you could play core adventures, but you're always coming back to this region. And yeah, I noticed the same thing with conflicts, conflicts and intrigues. It was this political stuff that didn't easily translate to adventures. And then there's mm -hmm. the typical, and there's bandit activity in the Bramblewood, or there's yeah, monsters coming out of the barrier. <laughs> sure. mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, but it's like that everywhere. What, how yeah. do we adventurify this region to make the politics not an NPC, but to make it right an important PC in this campaign that, that we're yeah. playing? Yeah, and I don't I don't remember enough about the region, but it, you know, one of the possibilities that you say, well, since Zaif was not a region, uh, then you could uh possibly take on the sort of Al Akbar mystery and un try to unravel, you know, why have we been so kind of uh zealous in our say taking over Bissell when we're supposed to be the good guys and serving Al Akbar, you know, and that could be more interesting to figure out why we've been going in a particular way. Zaif wasn't Zaif wasn't a region. I don't think it was. Uh, at least I'm not okay, seeing it here on the list at the back. Okay, because I rem I set a core adventure or part of a core adventure in Zaif, and I yeah. thought I was. I know there was an Al Akbar story track. I don't know if that was through core yeah. or if it was in you know maybe it was in this region. Cat, I don't recall. Yeah, because yeah, huh. I remember I... Bissell hearing about it, but I yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, one of the interesting parts, and we really haven't talked about it, was since there was this, you know, world group world building aspect to mm -hmm. it. If you were doing it right, you were reaching out as a creator, you were reaching mm -hmm. out to other regions to say, hey, I'm doing my regional adventure, but I want to skirt into your region. Could you, could we work together and you tell me, you know, what would yeah. be here and we can make have fun or a core adventure that was in a region that was represented by a triad it was polite for the core writer to reach out and say i'm writing this adventure it's going here could you work with me and we'll we'll tie it into one of your stories and and, uh, yeah. and even resolve player action so i'll try to tell this very very quickly but we had a situation where on the yahoo group for the the jeff region a person from another region started posting about how they're hanging out in town. And then they started saying the name. I forget whose name it was, but one of the demon lords over and over again. And like the watch showed up to try to stop them and all this, but they kept doing it and they were pretty powerful wizards. So they were able to sort of like, well, what the triad ended up doing, our triad decided to create a gateway to hell in our favorite tavern. <laughs> <laughs> or to, to, to the uh, abyss and yeah. uh and then players were like we want to find that wizard and hold them accountable so then the two triads spoke together over the region this person was from and the region where it had happened and they coordinated a strike team attack on that player characters and sort of told them hey look there's a strike team coming for you we're going to resolve this which ended up with the player's character being bound in stone and presented to our king for you know <laughs> deciding what to do with and yeah it was really very wild and fun and just the kind of thing that could happen just out of nowhere in in this living gray hot campaign right quite wild then we will boogie on to the next region as i turn the page which are the lendore islands 
Do you want to start with this one? Yeah, so this is kind of like if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings concepts and, you know, we all sail off into the sea or Everest on the Forgotten Realms. It has some of that feel to it um, as a elven area with the following the Church of Sehenin, um, the highest cleric of Sehenin lives here. And we get a picture of dolphins swimming and, and a ship going across. But this is really far off the, the map. Uh, it is on your all the way to the east on on the edge of your map. This clump of large isles is not a sm these are not small islands that live uh, or that are kind of placed um, all the way east and, and south of the area, kind of s east of Sunday. So it is not close to anything else. And that's deliberate because this sort of concept of like Lord of the Rings or Forgotten Realms that, you know, one would have to go out of their way to even hear about this. and end up here um what else would you add sean in, in its history so so first of all this is both this combines this idea of a theocracy mm -hmm. with the idea of elven uh its species feeling mm -hmm. superior and yeah so you start with that and then a soul wizard named lendore i don't know if that's how you pronounce it but that's how i do uh brought uh he and his followers to one of these islands and there was tension but the elves finally said fine you stay where you are we'll stay where we are and there was a a peace that actually turned into an alliance when a threat threatened more than one island so it seemed like everything was was fine uh lindore finally passed away and there was a whole there were omens and there were prophecies and all sorts of things happened but finally the elves must have decided that well we want that island too enough is because enough. they 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 came and they took the island over uh violently although it, it was a bloodless war but <laughs> it was still Right. It, it was, uh, well, many, many people, because of the prophecy, knew this was coming. So they were able to either escape via ships or escape via a portal. But the ones who were left, when the elves got there, they didn't kill the, the humans. They just said, okay, you leave. And if you stay, you you're going us. to be our, you're going you're gonna to serve us. And not in a, oh, we'll pay you a fair wage sort of mm -hmm. way. Uh, to the point where the human servants of the elves were not allowed to talk unless they were directly addressed by an elf. Yeah, it's, so, it's a weird region um, <laughs> and and hard to know. Again, one of those that you're like, wow, this is a real NPC region. Like, it's hard to know what you would do if you if you use this as your basis. Gee, what what would you there? There is there are. Um, uh, rebel humans here and there are half elves that that. Uh, remain from earlier times who who have kind of conflicting agendas but i mean boy i don't know that any of this would be any fun um it's a it's a strange region and if you were to, to do something with it in 2024 i would want to change kind of almost all of this and maybe dig into that feeling of it is your everesca right your more elven place off the end and 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 maybe that they welcome scholars from other you know, just change it up somehow right have a change to to get rid of this kind of species war aspect that uh yeah does not resonate today to me yeah and you like island nations well we've got another one for you coming right up the lordship of the isles this is an independent monarchy but it's not really independent because it answers directly to the scarlet brotherhood so this was once ruled by an aridi prince and there were also now this is I should say these isles are south of the Lindore Islands. Yeah. So it's you're still in the same area. You're still dealing with the same sorts of issues in terms of naval uh, power, trade, piracy, etc. So these islands were were uh, held by Aridi. The, the great kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But as most colonial powers, 
you can only hold on to things far away from the seat of power, especially if they're islands and involve the Navy for so long. And lots of pirates. So, lots of pirates were causing problem to the point where the Great Kingdom actually got its entire naval fleet together and crushed the pirates. But you can't keep a good pirate down. So <laughs> or know, a bad some one. escaped. <laughs> Or a bad one. So some escaped, some you know held out, and then when the navy went away, the pirates came back, took taking possession of some smaller islands, and so these islands, the the possession of them and the rulership of them changed hands several times. Then the Scarlet Brotherhood got involved and took control of the islands through the prince, Prince Framlar Ingerscotty. Yeah. And that's where the situation is currently. The Scarlet Brotherhood controls everything, uh, but the sub rulers, the, the rulers of the smaller islands who are, you know, subjects of the prince sort of know the deal. They know that the prince is in the pocket of the Scarlet Brotherhood. So they are, while offering fealty, uh, with one wink, they are planning their own power play on um, with the other wink. Yeah, it's a little weird for me because there's this whole idea of how profitable it is, right? But the problem is this is on the corner of the map. And the only thing south mm -hmm. is the Amedio jungle or is the Amedio right. jungle? No, the um, Hipmonoland. Uh, yeah. So Hipmonoland is down below. And so it's one of these ideas. It's very colonial in its in its approach. Yeah. It doesn't super say it in this version, but you know where's the where's the trade and money coming from? Because you're sort of far off from where all the nations are. So what is it? Well, you've got to be extracting resources from the south and yeah. then fueling the racist Sewell Brotherhood and so Scarlet Brotherhood. Uh, none of it is great, and and yeah. uh, you know it, it doesn't. And it's also just so far off to the edge of the map. It's a little different when you say talk about the moon shades and you have a mix of things going on. You you have some clear commerce between the mainland and the the forces and the moon shades. And hey, you also have some pirates and some other stuff that makes a lot more sense, I think, than, than this does, uh, unless you're just going to super dig into a colonial kind of narrative. So I would absolutely change the lordship of the Isles to be different. It's It's fine to have pirates, but the its positioning and story is kind of eh, not fun yeah for me we're we're quickly running out of time here so thank you everyone for listening we do appreciate you giving your thoughts and attentions to us and we hope we are entertaining uh thank you to our patreon supporters our master dungeon supporters our master realm supporters get a special shout out in our show notes and our masters of the multiverse while we talk about you right now People like Walt Winfrey, Chris Webster, Javier Waziak, Jason Ward from Accidental Cyclops Games, Graham Ward, James Walton, Marcelo De Velasquez, The Valiant DM, Joe Tyler, Tres, Jeremy Talman from the D&D and TV podcast, Talos the Stormlord, Josh and Luanica of the Tabletop Journeys podcast, Chris Nesimosa, Andy Shotney, Chance Russo at Drago Russo, Azamandius Rex, Pugnus, Vladimir Printer from Croatia, Robert Pasley, Post Fiction RPG Audio, Mighty Zeus, Tom Nelson from the Deck of Player Safety, Falcon Neal, Sean Molly, John Mickey, Trey McLemore, Anna B. Meyer, Fantasy Cartography. Speaking of wonderful Greyhawk maps, it's the one we use. Eric Mengi, the Matha Magician, Paul Mata, Chad Lynch, Jim Klingler, aka DM Prime Mover, Brian King, the Mighty Jerd, Sean Hurst, Ben Heisler, and Paige Lightman, Scott Fitzgerald Gray at Insane Angel Studio, James Fisher, Andy Edmonds at Nerdronomicon.com, Will Doyle, Evil John, Calvin Bridges Avalos, Merrick Blackman, Steve Bissonette, Dave Bastienson, Craig Bailey, Lou Anders of Lazy Wolf Studios, and Keith Ammon of The Monsters Know What They're Doing. Thank you so much for your support. If you go to patreon.com slash mastering D and D, you too can give us your support, which we so, so greatly appreciate. 
You can also help us out by leaving a review on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to the podcast, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash at Mastering Dungeons to help us out there, like, subscribe, and do the things. Teos, if people want to just push me aside and, and just look at your stuff, where do they do that? Uh, well, they can find me at alphastream.org, though. Boy, I've, I, I have so many things I want to do. And mm -hmm. boy, that day job, relentless. Yeah, day job keeps getting in the way. Yeah. But let's say they want to get rid of me and find you. Where do they go? Oh, they can go to all the social medias at Sean Merwin. On Blue Sky and Mastodon, I'm doing a writing tabletop RPGs tip of the day. I'm about 14 or 13 in at this moment. And uh, so you can... Go follow me there and, and see those. You can also follow Mastering Dungeons at Mastering d d on Mastodon, Blue Sky, and all the social medias. And you can always find us on YouTube as well. Wow, what a day. So, whew. I don't know, Teos, what are we going to do now? Uh, I'm going to prove the world uh by making my own character builder that contains all of 2014 and 2024 until i realize i've run into ip infringement and copyright infringement and then i will be sued and i'll close it all down sounds sounds like fun so at least you've thought it through and that's the important thing <laughs> <laughs> i am making new D, D rules for 2024 and i am capitalizing all the words Thank you.